I know how crazy this sounds, but this is how almost everyone starts off their claim that they witnessed something paranormal. I should know, considering between the years of 2012 and 2013 I conducted over 60 interviews with people who claimed to have some sort of supernatural experience. I heard it all, aliens, ghosts, demons, shapeshifters, skinwalkers, possession, extra-dimensional beings. Every last bit of it was bullcrap as far as I was concerned, but I was researching a book. The premise was that I would go around the country and visit supposed sites of paranormal activity and do my best to debunk the claims made there, for the ones that I didn't dismiss outright anyway. Trust me when I say that there were plenty of them that were very easy to dismiss outright. One lady told me that goblins had been stealing her cigarettes, suffice to say I didn't investigate. In the course of that year I gathered a pretty good amount of material though. Everything from poor foundations and old piping, to drug use, to uncovering lies and false claims from scam artists. I came to find out that humans are capable of tricking themselves into believing all manner of crazy things, but I never experienced anything myself. At least not until the last case I took on, the Thornton House. That place was not like the others, there was no scam, no misidentification, and no hallucinations. That place was just wrong in every way imaginable. So now I have my own story to tell and I'm going to tell you. I know how crazy this sounds, but the Thornton House is evil. It started with the tip I was given by my publisher that there was a man in Arkansas that had recently been institutionalized with paranoid schizophrenia. He'd been found naked and carving crude symbols into his skin with a worn-out kitchen knife behind a local grocery store. Police and doctors had sorted through his ramblings to find that he'd been a transient for the last 10 years and the week prior to his discovery he decided to squat in the Thornton house as it had been abandoned since the early 90s. The man claimed that there were people hiding in the walls and beneath the floorboards who would appear and disappear just as quickly. Even more than that he claimed that there was something alive beneath the house and everyone was in danger. Despite the man's clearly deteriorated mental state. Police investigated the Thornton house and found pagan symbols carved into the walls, symbols very similar to what the man had cut into his own skin. The officers also reported hearing nearly inaudible voices but were unable to locate the source, as well as a generally uneasy feeling. Apparently shortly after a team of local paranormal researchers attempted to study the house only to flee three hours into their investigation claiming the site was too dangerous. This team of paranormal researchers claimed their cameraman was thrown from the second floor through an old railing and broke his ribs and collarbone in the process. I felt it was far more likely that they had a terrible accident in a worn down old house and the team decided to capitalize on it for recognition. My publishers and I attempted to line up interviews with those who claimed to have had experiences in the house. The officers declined our request and the paranormal researchers asked for a large payment to the exclusive rights to their full story giving some credence to my theory that they weren't exactly on the level, and sadly the transient man had passed away shortly after I became aware of the case. The official reports claimed he had a poor reaction to a sedative that they used to calm him during one of his frequent psychotic episodes. He seized and died exactly two months after setting foot into the Thornton house. Our attempts to get interviews with people connected to the house were not entirely fruitless though as through research I was able to track down the owner of the house, Tyler Thornton. He was living in Los Angeles and working in finance, he gave me permission to investigate the house, I think we were the first people to ask as he seemed somewhat shocked anyone would have any interest, and agreed to a short phone interview. Apparently the house had passed to him after his father's death from cancer in 1993. He claimed he hadn't been back to Arkansas since he left home at the age of 17. He told me that his mother had passed away shortly after he was born and his father grew increasingly cruel as time went on. Eventually Tyler ran away from Arkansas with his then-girlfriend to California and never looked back, not even for his father's funeral. He'd attempted to sell the house a couple of times but the thing had been in such disrepair that no buyer ever stayed on the line for long. Oftentimes a single walkthrough was all it would take to ensure they would get cold feet before putting down any money. I can remember the way his voice shook as he said those words, as if he knew something about the house he was scared to tell me. Even if he had attempted to dissuade me though I wouldn't have listened to him. The idea that everyone seemed so terribly terrified of this property only fueled my desire to prove that it was nothing more than wood and plaster with a legend fueled by atmosphere and overactive imaginations. Even as he ominously told me to be careful before he hung up the phone, my nerves stayed steady and my mind stayed resolute. 
I booked my trip to Arkansas that night with plans to stay three nights in the Thornton house just as I had every other murder site and abandoned asylum I'd visit. This place didn't even have that kind of history. From my interview I'd found that no one had ever died in the house to Tyler's knowledge. His father died in a hospital in Little Rock after collapsing in local park. He had been expected to be on bed rest at home but it was assumed he was delirious. When paramedics got to him he was mumbling nonsense according to their official reports. I was confident that this would be yet another three nights of listening to the wind and banging on old pipes. I'd seen enough strings of strange occurrences lead to nothing to not expect anything more than that. Much to my own surprise, I didn't remain in that house through the first night. I remember my first approach to the house which was isolated at the end of a dirt road. The nearest neighbor was roughly a mile back the way I'd come. Not exactly the ends of the earth but certainly enough out of the way that it added to the atmosphere, especially at dusk. From the outside it looked to be in reasonably good shape. The paint was chipped and faded but it was hardly the rotting pile of wood that Tyler had made it seem like. I grabbed my phone, notepad, and the keys I had picked up from the realtor that morning and walked across the overgrown lawn towards the front door. I could see streaks of blood around the door handle and running across the porch banister. I recalled that in the police report the transient man had been bleeding quite badly when they found him, so I deduced the blood was likely his. I made sure to snap a few pictures before unlocking the front door and proceeding inside the house. Now I'm not saying my whole view of the world changed as soon as I crossed the threshold of the Thornton house, no. I will say though that the place had a quality about it that I didn't feel in any of the other supposedly haunted sites I'd visited. A thickness in the air that immediately puts pressure on your chest. An overly oppressive atmosphere and feeling of being watched by eyes that wanted you to leave. In general, the place simply felt ugly. The first night of my research was always investigating the house fully, from top to bottom. Learning every nook and cranny, every pipe, and every hiding spot, all the while of course keeping vigilant for any signs of paranormal activity I could document. I may not have been a big believer but I was certainly a professional. I shook off the weight of the air around me and put my headphones in. I always ran through a Beatles playlist while I worked. I found the upbeat music to make the work feel a little less dour as I walked through some seriously grim places. I was vigilant though, I kept a recorder running on me at all times to make sure any disembodied voices would be captured. Up to then I had a whole lot of recordings of me shuffling around and occasionally singing along to Let It Be. The vibe of this place, regardless of if I believed in the paranormal aspect of it or not, made the headphones even more valuable. I clicked on my flashlight and got to work. As per usual I decided to work my way from the top of the house to the bottom. This house had no attic so I would be starting with the second floor where all the bedrooms were located. I carefully climbed the rotting stairs to the tune of, here comes the sun, and made a right turn into the hallway. I could see four doors, two on my left side, one on my right, and one at the very end. Faded and damaged paintings of scenery were hung along the walls and a few of them lay broken on the floor. I could feel glass crunching beneath my feet as I walked to the single door at the end of the hall. I brushed my fingers along the symbols that had been mentioned in the police reports and felt an odd shiver slide down my spine. It faded away as I stood in front of the door and prepared to get to work. I was struck by the stink of mildew and rot as I pushed the door open. Beyond I could see walls that were once white tile now stained with mold and filth. I saw a broken toilet leaned against the wall in the left-hand corner of the room and a rusted old tub and sink on my left. I could barely see my reflection in the layer of scummy film that covered the bathroom mirror as I stepped over to the sink and twisted the knob. As expected the pipes were empty and silent, the rot was old and likely had more to do with the leaky roof than leaky pipes. I pulled out my notepad and started jotting down my observations so far. That was when I heard it through my headphones. The chorus of strawberry fields doing nothing to mask the sound of what seemed like something heavy dragging across wood and thudding against a wall. I dropped my notebook in the filthy sink as I tore the music from my ears in a moment of sudden surprise. My eyes widened as I looked out into the hall from beyond the open bathroom door, but there was nothing there. The house had gone silent again aside from the faint sound of strawberry fields giving way to can't buy me love coming from earbuds dangling from my neck. I stood frozen for a series of minutes just staring into the hall with my flashlight waiting for something to cross into its beam, but only emptiness greeted me. I laughed to myself and shook my head, I couldn't believe that I'd let the place get to me. It was most likely that my walking around the house jostled something loose and it had fallen. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if I went downstairs to find a cross beam laying across the living room floor, the place was a wreck after all. 
I put my headphones back in my ears just in time to hear the last verse of Can't Buy Me Love and reached over to the sink to pick up my notebook. Much to my surprise it was gone. I searched all around the sink, the wretched smell coming from the pipes and drain filling my nostrils as I ducked down and searched around to the tune, why don't we do it in the road? The notebook had somehow vanished. I checked all my pockets again to make sure I wasn't remembering wrong and then checked all around the sink one more time to be sure. It was on this second look that I noticed the hole in the wall. It was tucked up behind the pipes of the sink in such a way that it was easy to miss. The opening was about the size of my fist and despite the fact that it seemed nearly impossible I could see my little notebook folded up and sticking out of it to rest against the bend of rusted and corroded metal in front of it. I swallowed hard my mind filled with visions of some large yellow-toothed rat leaping from the darkness behind the wall to take a chunk out of my hand. I slid my fingers into the space between the pipes and wall and it felt like sludge and slime had collected in the spaces I couldn't see. I gagged a little bit as my fingers finally touched the paper and I attempted to pull the notebook free. The song from my playlist ended and I expected to hear Yellow Submarine or maybe while my guitar gently weeps but instead I heard a low growl for a moment and what sounded like someone whisper we're only halfway there through my earbuds in a deep voice that seemed to almost be layered with a coat of mucus. Just as the voice spoke I felt something sharp rake across my fingertips and disappear back into the hole. I howled in pain and fell backwards onto the floor gripping my fingers as the gurgling voice faded out all together now, kicked into its first chords as if the playlist hadn't missed a beat. The happy upbeat swing of the song I was hearing nearly matched my racing heart as I sat there staring into the darkness of the hole. I sat up and moved closer, raising my flashlight as the song sped up in the same way it always had, but this time it seemed to be taking my heart rate with it. What the hell just happened? I asked myself. If it was out loud or in my head, I surely can't remember. My light crept into the hole as slowly as I could possibly move it. At first there was nothing, but in a pace that matched my own crawl to the truth a single, scaly, clawed digit poked its way out of the dark and curled downwards to scratch against the wood. Then another, and another, and finally behind it a bulbous milky eye opened, like the eye of a rotting fish. I leapt to my feet and scrambled backwards towards the door. I steadied myself on the door frame for a moment as, all together now, looped in my ears, Somehow the song had stuck itself on repeat. I felt the wood of the door frame pulse beneath my cut fingers and I flinched away, my mind still reeling from what I'd seen beneath the sink. The cuts on my fingers had smeared blood onto the wood, blood that was now fading away as if being greedily devoured by the house itself. I could feel the floor ripple beneath my feet and as I shone my flashlight around the room I could tell the whole room was pulsing almost to the rhythm of the song in my ears. My wounded fingers dripped blood onto the floor that was quickly absorbed into the seams between the boards as I looked on at the mad scene in complete horror. My senses screamed for my legs to move but it suddenly felt as if my body were encased in concrete. It wasn't until sounds of things scratching behind the walls rose up in chorus loud enough to break through, all together now, and the voice returned this time somehow mixed in behind the music, we're only bomb a bom halfway there bomb a bom, that I was able to break away. I turned and sprinted down the hallway which seemed to be breathing, some of the remaining paintings falling to the ground, their glass shattering at my feet. I made the turn and headed towards the stairs. The door was in my sight as the second stair from the top gave way under the weight of my body and sent me crashing through the floor. I don't even remember if I had time to scream before total darkness swallowed me and I slammed hard into the damp concrete floor of the basement and felt rotting pieces of wood rain down on me from above. My whole body was racked with pain. As I attempted to get to my feet I could feel my arm hanging loose from its socket, I had dislocated my shoulder. Every breath I took filled my chest with fire and sent a shooting pain up and down my side, my ribs were at least bruised if not broken entirely. On top of the more severe damage I could feel blood running down my skin from deep cuts made by jagged boards that had caught my body on the way down. With hazy eyes I surveyed my surroundings to see the room awash in the orange glow of lit candles upon an altar adorned with red cloth. Behind it was some kind of occult symbol I couldn't recognize, and in my time I'd seen many and learned their meanings. The headphones had finally fallen from my ears and could clearly hear what sounded like claws scraping the stone walls of the basement. The noise came from all around me and passed that I heard the sound of all together now playing at what sounded like half tempo. Like someone was slowing down a record. I pulled the phone from my pocket half expecting it to be coming from the speaker now that the headphones had been detached, but the phone was smashed from the fall. The song was coming from the walls. One, two, three, four, can I have a little more? 
I hunted around the room for any sign of an exit, but it was pitch black outside of the light of the candles. Hands with scaly clawed digits like the thing in the hole grasped at me from the darkness, their bodies forming themselves from the shadows and the walls as if they were trying to find some purchase in the real world. I could hear them scratching and whispering. I slammed the heel of my palm against my head with my usable hand as if that might quiet them, as if it was all in my mind. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I love you. We are halfway there. A, B, C, D. Can I bring my friend to T? Complete what has been broken. I love you. Let us out. The voices of gurgling madness, half bent in rage and agony, stuck in my mind like fish hooks being drugged across my skin. I saw things in my head as I stumbled my way through the dark, eviscerated bodies, a heart with a blade through it, an old man who looked sickly and pale, near death in fact, chanting. I heard the promises made to him, of life everlasting. None of it was clear but the puzzle comes together in my mind now. Tyler Thornton's father was attempting to save his own life and he had resorted to disturbing means to do so. Some ritual left unfinished as death caught up to him before he could see his plan through. I snapped back to reality as I stumbled over a rusted wheelchair and into a wall. I felt the hands grasp at me and graze their claws across my skin. I screamed and howled as I attempted to tear myself free. I gripped at jutting stones that became hands trying to encircle my wrists, writhing humanoid torsos half birthed and pulsing lunge for me as I backed away, begging for freedom and screaming in total agony. I pulled free and fell backwards to the floor again. The sounds and sights around me felt like they were tearing my brain apart and just as I thought I may lose my mind entirely a massive pulsing eye opened on the ceiling above me. It was yellow and bulging and as the pupil flicked madly around the room it dripped some kind of viscous fluid down on me. Freedom. It growled from within the walls. Blood, more blood. The music continued to play slowly as it repeated what it said over and over again, until the words seemed to melt together into white noise. I frantically searched for any sign of a way out and my heart leapt into my throat as my eyes caught sight of what looked like a seam in the darkness that let light leak through. A door. A window. It didn't matter. It was some kind of way out of the hell I was in. I managed to pull myself to my feet through sheer will and charge towards the opening. The hands clawed at my clothes and tore at my hair and skin. The horrifying eye of whatever being had become trapped in that damned house fixed on me as I battled through what felt like a mass grave of corpses that refused to let go of life. My body struck wood and it splintered under my weight. I thanked God for the dilapidated state of the house, for in better days I doubt I could have broken through the door in my state. I fell back to cold concrete but I had made it out of the room with the altar and into the basement proper. My eyes saw moonlight shining through basement windows, old shelves containing knickknacks and tools collected over a lifetime, and most importantly stairs that led to freedom. I could feel eyes staring at me through cracks in the walls and hear fingers scratching and clawing at their prison of stone and rotting wood. I felt the vibrations in my chest as some great old thing howled for freedom as the music it mimicked in such a horrifying way faded into nothingness behind its anger. I stumbled up the stairs and out of the house into the fresh air of the night. I remember weeping like a baby as I felt the cool night air on my skin and saw my car in the driveway. I ran towards it and got in without ever looking back in the direction of that damn place. Not even as I started the engine and slammed my foot down on the gas and tore down the road and as far away from that place as I could get, did I ever look back. I abandoned the book after I got out of the hospital despite some protest from my publisher. I told them that after the accident, I'd head at the Thornton house, crawling around old abandoned buildings had lost any appeal to me, as there was little there to begin with. I couldn't tell them the real story that writing a book from the point of view of someone who didn't believe when I'd seen what hides in the shadows with my own eyes was going to be impossible. So instead I share my story here and leave you with a warning. Do not go near Thornton House, no matter if you have heard of it, or know its location. No matter if you're curious, or if you want to see the truth for yourself. There is no good that comes from it, only darkness and a mind left filled with visions of horrors and whispers in your ears that never go away. I still hear the voices in my head and see that yellowing eye bulging out from somewhere beyond this world, so close to freedom. I still fear what happens if it ever gets what it wants.